that I'll, I'll you know get myself off screen here and, and let Craig take it away. Like I said, if you have questions, uh, type them into the chat function in the bottom. And uh, once Craig gets through his presentation here on LSR basics, we will uh, we'll get to those Q and A at the end. So thanks again, everybody, for joining. And Craig, take it away. Thank you, sir. Uh, first, I would like to thank Sodic, uh, uh, Len, and Bennett for allowing us to provide uh, this presentation for you all today. Thank you all for taking your time. Uh, we're going to go over, as the, you can see on the slide of the presentation, liquid silicone rubber basics. So, every a lot of people are are uh, know some uh, with elastomers looking more at thermoplastics versus thermosets. So we're going to go over more of the liquid silicone background, what you need to get your process up and going. Uh, just a little overview for liquid silicone rubber. Looking at your advantages, you know, again, being chemically inert, odorless, bacterial resistant, easy to sterilize would make it very popular for running certain applications. The flexibility of uh, temperatures from negative 180 Fahrenheit upwards of 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Your fast cycles, which allow multi cavity molds, extremely low flash tolerances. With those low viscosities of the material, we're looking at lower injection pressures. And when we talk about the low viscosity, that's the measure of the resistance of the material where we can measure uh, different centipoise um, of that material. Uh, as well, you're looking at overmold and two shot capabilities where we can actually mold a liquid silicone rubber with a thermoplastic, either with a mechanical or a chemical bond. The shipping of your liquid silicone rubber, we like to look at a uh, lot match 20 liter, 5 gallon, or 55 gallon containers. When we talk about lot match, we want to make sure that the lot numbers are matched up versus not trying to run uh, one material from a year ago versus a newer material. Um, there are an expiration date to that material. Uh, and then we look at that expiration date for the storage of the material at a room temperature. And we like to say that that material is good up to that expiration date. Once the two materials, your A and your B, come together, uh, we like to say that you at an average pot life of 72 hours at a room temperature. Your MSDS and certifications, description of the materials, your test results on the COAs that you'll receive, appearance, viscosity, T values, it also give you the hardness, the tensile, and the tear of that material that you're running for your application. Again, the viscosity, we like to call silicone a shear thinning material, and it's easily pourable to paste. Some examples, water, if give you a good example, you have one centipoise, where you look at peanut butter up to 250,000 centipoise. That's creamy peanut butter, not chunky peanut butter. Uh, typical LSR viscosities, you're looking anywhere from 500,000 upwards of 2 million centipoise. So there is a wide range there where you can have the different types of materials, different shore hardnesses, durometers of the silicone that you're running. Looking at your manufacturing process, we're looking at the manufacturing process of LSR, uh, LIM, liquid injection molding, HCE, which is a heat cured elastomer, or TPE, thermoplastic elastomer. Well, for liquid silicone rubber, we have our feed pumps. We have our A and our B materials which feed at a one-to-one -one ratio to our injection molding machine from the mold. And we like to go right into the finish, from the finished part uh, into the box out the door. For our heat cured elastomer, we have a preform where we could have a manual feed or options for automatic feed into our injection press or transfer compression to our mold. You could have a trimming process and then your finished part is out the door. Um, a lot of you might be very familiar with the thermoplastic elastomer process where we have a vacuum feed for pellets into the hopper, into your injection molding machine, molded and out the door. Looking at the differences from your thermoplastic elastomer to your LSR, here is an example of a SODIC machine, but this SODIC is set up a little differently. Instead of set up for thermoplastics, we have it set up for LSR, so we are needing a LSR metering and mixing system to our feed throat to deliver that material to our mold. When we talk about setting up with uh, injection molding machine, 
example, Sodic. This is a customer, uh, a vendor out there to help customers. They are a company that manufactures liquid silicon rubber. There are, or, sorry, it, it, liquid silicon rubber injection molding machines. I got a little bit ahead of myself, I apologize. Um, you can see by the vendors that we have on the screen here, you always wanna to go to the vendor that knows uh, the, the equipment. They know how to do this. And they're taking a basic injection molding machine concept, but they're upgrading it to an LSR, um, you know, utilizing a metering and mixing system supply and then extra options as well. Mold heats, not barrel heats, shut off nozzle options, valve gate controls if needed, water flow regulation and a vacuum sequence if that's needed for your setup. When we look at the overall spec of the setup, we're looking at our mold, which is mostly in the industry, we're looking at electrically heated, anywhere from 300 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. There can be a wide range of temperatures you, you're utilizing there, depending on the type of parts you're running. Cold runner, we want to, we want to stop the curing happening. So we want to put a chilled system onto our static mixer, screw and barrel. So we want a cold runner anywhere from 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, vacuum control for that. Our liquid silicone rubber, it is a viscous fluid. Again, it comes in five or 55 gallon containers. And we want that mixing ratio to be a one-to-one. -one. I have an asterisk there because depending on the type of part you're manufacturing, depending on the type of LSR, we can go away from that ratio about 5%, um, but we wanna make sure that the general properties are still within that specification you need as we're running. The injection molding machine, again, standard injection molding machine, but we're changing a few things. For example, let's say an optimized non-return valve, a conveying screw and cold barrel assembly, extra options needed for that LSR molding cell. When we look at the LSR mixing unit, we can go pneumatic, servo, or hydraulic. Material pressure supply, roughly 3,000 PSI. And again, that can change depending on your part size, shot size, type of material running. And the interface, we always talk about a closed loop system for that LSR interface. We need that to ensure we're getting consistent fill. Looking at your LSR basics for your injection unit, you're looking at standard conveying screw where we have a material outlet valve. We've got water cooled static mixer. And again, that static mixer is there to help slow the vulcanization process, the cure process of that material once the A and the B come together. We have a pressure transducer mounted below that shutoff. And that is an option, but it is a process aid. It can help you with your process if you can monitor during your run, you know what your, what your pressure is at. Over time, velocity at the walls are zero, remember, but over time, it starts as it starts to skin cure, that the, the flow through gets a lot smaller. So as our pressure starts to drift off, this is a process aid to allow us to, to inform us, we need to tear down and clean. We need to take care of uh, preventive maintenance is in order. Again, zero compression screw, we're looking at feeding only. There's very minimal mixing done with an LSR screw. Uh, Spring-loaded non-return valve, this is, allows us to shut off. And because of the material being viscous, when we inject, we won't get back pressure pushing back up through the system. We want to make sure we're keeping that shot in front of the non-return valve. The water-cooled abrasion resistance barrel, again, we're creating friction and heat in there. We want to keep things cooled down and ending with our pneumatic shutoff nozzle to put material into the mold. Now, that was a standard conveying screw. You have another option of a plunger injection system. Now, with the material feed throat, this can be set up, as you can see, thermoplastic, or we can change for a LSR feed throat. The conveying screw, it works like that single acting extruder, but the beauty of this system set up is as it's feeding down through our plunger injection, during the pathway is closed off. So when we, when it injects, that pathway is, is, is this, the motor comes forward and creates a, a, a shutoff where material cannot repressurize back up. So this, in turn, works as, as a, uh, a non-return valve, but in the plunger injection system setup. And the beauty of something like this 
is for micro molding. Let's say we our shot size is less than a gram. There is a possibility to fill up this for six uh, up to six grams and then step into our shot. So this works very well for that micro molding application that you might be looking at for LSR. The material delivery system, we're looking at metering and mixing systems. These are just three examples here on my screen. We have a Graco F4-5. This is a specific five gallon system, a 2KM Silcostar E-Flow. This can be five or 55 gallon system and an Element Top 5000, which can be five and 55 gallon as well. Uh, each company is different. Um, we have, for example, the Graco is a pneumatic. The Silcostar E-Flow is a servo driven um, and the Element Top 5000 is a servo uh, pneumatic style system. When we always talk, I talked before about a, a control system, a closed loop. And that closed loop system we're looking for is the metering control. And this screenshot kind of shows an overview of that control where you're looking at the A and B mix ratio, making sure we're staying one to one. Um, our working pressure, how much material is left, as well as, as you can see on the screen, we have impulses between the A and the B, making sure that ratio is staying one to one. Um, the reason we want this, this closed loop is we're only wanting material when the machine is calling for it. We don't want a uh, high pressure on our shutoff at all times. Now you're changing the consistency of that fill to where you're having inconsistent cycles where you might non-fill one shot or flash on another. Um, with that metering system, you also are looking for uh, a third, fourth, or fifth stream regulation. And you can see that up in the top left where you see the additive control. This is where if you're going to color or add a different type of dispersion, you want to be able to have that tight con process control for your system. Now, specking out your system is also important for your setup because you're looking at the capacity. What's the volume of material I'm going to process per week, per month, annually? Um, so you want to look at, do you need a five gallon system, a 55 gallon system? Are the possibility of you looking at cartridges if it's small enough? Um, that looks, that, that then tends to take you to micro molding controls. You want, again, properly size that injection unit and shot volume for your static mixer, your, uh, your mixing block. And the reason being is if you have too large of a system, you're not getting a good turbulent flow through that static mixer. And to flow through that static mixer, we start with our A and B coming into our mixing block. This is where we blend our A and B materials and then options for that dispersion. From that static mixer, again, it's water cooled, and this is where our material starts to tumble together. That static mixer is going to give us a good homogenous mix between the A and the B, and then a, a dispersion if that is an option you're looking at. Again, water cooled, sized properly for what you're mixing. We're looking at a pressure reduction valve, and the reason for that is to stabilize the pump pressure. Um, if you look at an oscilloscope, you have an up and down wave. We don't want that into our process. From our pressure reduction valve, we want a nice steady stream of material into that feed throat to allow us to get a consistent shot size. And under that uh, pressure reduction valve on this setup, we've got our shutoff. And our shutoff isolates our pump pressure, but then also our shot. So we're not keeping a wide open range where if we're just asking for an inch, we're not getting bleed back into that shot and then we overfill. Um, we don't wanna flash the parts over. We also have options for a filter assembly and that's to catch foreign debris. Um, it is an option because again, if you're running, let's say a hot runner, which we'll get into here later in the slide um, versus a valve gate, you wanna be able to ensure that you're not getting foreign substances to catch or damage into your internal system. Um, that means you have to shut down, tear out, tear down, um, and you could do some internal damage. Uh, and again, uh, as I talked earlier, the options for the pressure transducer, very, very great process aid uh, to use as you're, as you're setting up your process and you get your variables set.
As we talk about static mixers, um, again, this is where our A and B coming in, um, giving us, as you can see by the, the picture uh, on the left, this allows A and B to come in and we're getting a good homogenous mix. Static mixer is the preferred method versus a dynamic as the dynamic tends to create heat. But we also, again, as I, I stated, we want to specify this out properly for the size. Uh, too many, you know, we've got a residence time. And for this example of Graco, this is their cylindrical static mixer. So you can fit as many as 15 smaller plastic elements in here. Now, if you're running a, um, a higher viscosity material, you might have a pressure drop across the face. So you might not get a good reading on your pressure regulation uh, gauge versus if you have two less static mixers, you're getting an incorrect ratio of material. You're not getting a good homogenous mix. And sometimes in clear, when you're running just clear LSR, you might not see that. But when we start adding dispersions into this, um, increased ratio of color, different types of pigments, you will see that you're not getting a good homogenous mix. So this is something to definitely talk, uh, talk to your vendor about to ensure you're specifying this out properly. The pressure regulation, again, you know, this is where we want to isolate those pump strokes. So the your direction of your pump stroke, you have high and low pressures. We want those fluctuations to be flat. We want our inlet pressure to be a nice, smooth flow. Uh, this allows us to get a consistent fill. And again, looking at this, we can see, um, you know, with this regulator and the gauge, Again, it, it shows us performance of our non return valve. If that's if you have a standard conveying screw uh, injection system, if your non return valve is leaking or you have, let's say, a foreign uh, substance that is stuck in it, every time we inject, path of least resistance of the material is going to flow back past that non return valve. In turn, we'll spike that gauge. That's something that we can see as a process aid as well as pre curing of the material or any kind of pressure loss. The injection barrel, the assembly, you're looking at, again, a standard bimetallic barrel cooling sleeve and the material seal on the back of the barrel on, and uh, courtesy of angle here. Um, there's also options where you have the seal on the screw itself. You have the feed throw interface where the barrel flange, you either have a bolt on pattern or a threaded interface. So this allows for different options of different types of nozzle setups for your injection unit. Looking at your conveying screw, again, this is a thermal set, not a thermoplastic. Zero compression, feeding only, very minimal mixing. Your LD is shorter as the screw is ideally for mixing. Ideally, we're looking at a 16 to 1, but we can be shorter in that ratio. Again, material uh, towards the end drive. The seal, again, can either be on the screw itself or on the barrel assembly, depending on the setup. And the screw can be surface hardened or through hardened, depending on that diameter. Your non-return valve, it's made up of your valve body and your shutoff platen. But now we've got a spring added in this for this type of setup. For LSR, again, as we're conveying material forward, the compression of that material compresses that spring forward, allowing material to fill off. The movement as it stops, shuts that spring back and creates a tight seal. So material cannot leak back during our injection. And that allows us to keep a consistent shot. Um, you can run LSR without a spring, um, loaded non-return valve, but sometimes you have to give it a quick hit on your injection profile to be able to shut that platen body, uh, platen onto the body. And sometimes that can hinder your process depending on if you're micro molding or the, the type of part you're manufacturing. If it's a thin wall, you could streak into that part. So the best is to always utilize for liquid silicone rubber, that spring loaded non-return valve. The injection units, same, same as any setup with an injection molding machine. You've got your hydraulic drive and your servo electric drive. Hydraulic drive, I like always like to say it's an elephant. It just works. It's your standard system, proven repeatability and precision. 
profiled speed and process control. You always have to look though in your operating range, that 20 to 75% capacity for best resolution. Again, with LSR, under that 20%, we really wanna make sure that we're getting a good material flow through our static mixer into our screw. Over that 75% limit, now we're still metering um, in a longer cycle due to the fact that we we have to get past that 75 percent range so then maybe in turn we go to the servo electric drive looking at the best repeatable resolution dynamic speed control um, but due to that servo drive the injection unit can works independently from the clamping system so as the clamp is opening and we're in process to remove parts we could still be metering that screw back uh, the other beauty of it is zero hydraulics. So there's no heat up time or fluctuations in your parameters due to the hydraulics needing to heat up. Also, a larger operating range due to the higher resolution. Um, you've got a better resolution on your servo electric drive with, with all materials, including your LSR. Your pneumatic shutoff nozzles so these are what is mount these are mounted to the end of your screw and barrel and this is that interface to your mold we've got different uh different company setups here as you can see the difference between the three that i have here we've got radius and diving nozzle diving nozzles work more for your valve gate or open tip technologies versus your radius that's more towards let's say a hot runner there are water requirements for them, um, not always for a cold runner uh, setup. You always need cold water though, the chilled water for your uh, hot runner setup is we don't wanna cure that nozzle. That is your interface to that hot mold. Looking at clamping units, the clamping unit for LSR is a bit different because silicone as it heats, it expands. So we want to make sure that we have enough clamping force to hold back that expansion of the part. So we're looking for a tonnage requirements for silicone. We want to calculate out the surface area, and then we always want to multiply that two to, by two to three tons per square inch. And again, that's, that is needed to overcome that expansion of the LSR material. So your thicker parts need a higher clamp for your thinner parts need, need a, don't need as high as clamp because there's less expansion. So there's, there's always that little trick in setting up the, the platen. You need a platen size large enough to fit your mold in there, but depending on how big that part is, that platen might not be big enough. So you always want to discuss this with your mold builder on what clamping force is needed to shut off on these parts. And again, you have the options of electric versus hydraulic clamping unit, tie bar versus uh, tie barless design. Um, tie bar, it works, keeps keeps things uh, keeps things in a, in a zero path. Versus, you know, your tie barless, you have that flex link, so things are coming together. But then you're also looking at different ways to automate, different ways to remove parts. You don't always have to come in through the top. Um, options of extended clamp force program to prevent uh, air traps and flash. Options for liquid silicone rubber for molding, you have a vacuum. So a vacuum system is, is set up to control the, uh, to, to evacuate the air in the cavity, not the whole mold, we just wanna focus on that cavity. So this allows us for a higher injection velocity while eliminate those problems where we might run into venting or flash issues. The vacuum valve switchable and machine software is available. Always talk to the, uh, your machine manufacturer about that. You have the system monitoring as well as the vacuum pump and the setup. Always get your vacuum release valve. That's very important. That way, if you're using vacuum seals in the mold, when you're opening, you're not popping out, uh, you're, you're, you're not, you're, uh, sorry, when you open, you still have vacuum set on your mold. So as you open, you pop the mold and you could damage your parts. So always make sure you have that vacuum release valve set up in the system to depress it, to allow that mold to open properly where you don't have to damage any parts. Cooling water requirements, a chiller, 
or a temperature control unit. Chilled water on average, we wanna look at between again, 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And we want this for our barrel, our nozzle, a material outlet valve and our cold runner system. We want this on a closed loop system. So if we have one chiller tied to one machine or we have one chiller tied to numerous machines, we just wanna make sure that we have enough tonnage on that chiller to cool properly for each machine. Uh, additional circuits, it's always nice to get those additional circuits for different auxiliary equipment for your static mixer, um, for your material outlet valve. Uh, again, as I mentioned, your barrel. Uh, if you're running a valve gated cold deck, how many circuits you need, the larger the mold, you're going to need possibly more circuits, maybe for your mounting plate. Maybe you also need cooling on your mounting plate on the moving side. So it's always important to look what's needed on that machine and maybe order just a few extra just in case. There's also options for flow monitoring to ensure you have that cooling. Um, let's say, uh, you know, here in the Midwest uh, with storms, we might lose power. Um, if we if we lose power or the chiller shuts off, it'll it'll stop the process and it will turn the heats off. Now, it, it, it might not stop you from curing certain things up, but it won't allow you to continue to bake and try to run and damage more equipment while it's running. So the flow monitoring could be important for your process. Always look into something like that. Water filtration, that is a must for certain systems like a cold runner. You have small pass throughs on water jackets. And we, again, we want to make sure we have clean filtered water and we're not getting any debris stuck in that filter, debris getting stuck in the filter so it does not get stuck downstream. Mold heating, uh, a lot of the Euromap has come through with different setups and standards. The Euromap 14, uh, I think is, is great. And this is a multi-pin connector setup where we could have all configured heaters and thermocouples all in one plug or separated out like you see on this slide where we have heaters on one side and we might have thermocouples on the op opposite side. Um, this allows us, uh, you know, very limited to zero setup errors. And the, the one thing with uh, mold heating for LSR, we want to look at uh, mold heating, not barrel heating. We need a higher amperage, um, sometimes 15 to 20 amps for your mold heats versus your barrel heats, roughly sometimes 10 to 12 amps. Um, if you try to run off your barrel heats with certain molds, you might trip that breaker. Um, word of the wise, just installing a higher amperage breaker, that could create problems because your wiring for the system is only set up for a certain gauge. So again, it's always, it's always right to set it up properly and get what's specified out for that system. Talking about the mold heating, we're looking at total power for that mold, not just the plate, but we wanna calculate out between the heater plate, cavity plates, and then the heater plate on, on the opposite side. So let's say stationary and moving. We wanna look at usually recommended 20 watts per square inch. And as you can see in these diagrams, mostly you're utilizing cartridge style heaters. Again, on average, 15 amps required. A lot of the newer heaters out there, something to watch for, they have internal thermocouples, which are nice, but as soon as you turn the mold heats on, within anywhere from five to 15 minutes, it'll tell you your mold's up to temp. I always like to have a read-only zone added in the face. Uh, sometimes it can't be done, but if you're able to, I recommend asking for that. That way you can actually see what your cavity face is. We want to make sure that your cavity face is as close to your set point as possible. So you're making sure if you're asking for 300 degrees Fahrenheit, we're within that five to seven degree range on that cavity set. Looking into LSR tooling now, I mentioned hot runner technology, a little different from thermoplastics. When we talk about hot runner, this is a throwaway. So this isn't a direct inject. We're going into a runner system with a radius nozzle. And from that runner, this is where we branch out to manufacture our parts. Um, this is mostly an LSR, it's built for low volume, short production runs, 
mostly operator driven. Now mind, there are options out there where it can be higher volume and you can automate it. Cycle times, uh, they're gonna be tend to be longer because you can see, for example, on this slide, that runner is a little thicker. So we need to make sure that we're curing that runner up properly. So you do have a higher material race. That runner is going to be discarded every cycle. Uh, again, I mentioned the sprue bushing is typically half inch radius on the hot runner tools, lower tooling costs, quick mold changes. Versus we're looking at cold runner technology. Again, chilled water to keep the manifold from cross-linking or vulcanizing, curing up. Your open nozzle versus a valve gate design. Um, not many uh, tool makers out there are making open nozzles uh, as much as they were in the past. Most tools are valve gate design. You have reduced material waste because again, with these applications, you're direct inject right into the part. Uh, so that is reduced material waste. Your reduced cycle time because we don't have to worry about trying to cure up that runner if the runner is heavier than the part. And then this is the best option for a fully automated process. We don't have to worry about a design and an engineering to try to remove the runner in process. Now we're only worried about work, uh, removing the part itself. With this type of setup and system, we're typically running a 15 millimeter diving nozzle. Unfortunately, you have higher tooling costs, prolonged tooling changes and increased preventive maintenance. You have more wear items, more moving parts. So instead of running on a hot runner per se, where I could run two or three types of two or three different jobs a day, this could take a little longer depending on cavitation. We talked about the open nozzle versus valve gate design. Here's an example of an open nozzle. So the, the open nozzle design actually utilizes cured material uh, to physically stop the material flow. So the this limits your part size and the ranges of viscosity um, as different viscosities, different part sizes, this can change your, uh, your total cycle time. Um, the cured slug, unfortunately, is going to be molded into your next part. So these are some, this is something you have to think about. Uh, as you can see, it's a little tighter on cavitation. We can get more nozzles in a space, but if you're running a clear part and you have some non-conformance areas, this might not be the way to go because you're going to push that slug into the next part and it's hard to detail out where it's going to sit in that cured part. Also, you can have gate vestige problems, uh, higher deep gates um, and clean filtered water is definitely a must with this. As small as these nozzles are, any small little particulate or foreign debris can clog up one of these water jackets and now instead of running at 100% on a nozzle, you can only be flowing 80%. And that could create problems as there's really no way to dial these nozzles in. Valve gate, most versatile. Um, this utilizes a mechanical shutoff pin to physically stop that material flow. You have enhanced uh, capabilities for control, PLC and sequential valve gating. Um, as I said, it's the most versatile, small parts, less than 0 0.01 grams, up to 200 plus gram parts are possible to run with, with a valve gated nozzle. You can fill faster, you can run hotter, have shorter cycles, but again, clean filtered water is a must. You can see in this diagram here where the material is coming through, but then also where the water flow is coming through. So you can see it's a smaller channel. We definitely, again, don't want to get any foreign uh, or foreign substances to block off our water channel. Talked a little bit about clamping units, and this just gives you a little rough estimation. So we're looking at, uh, I'll give you two examples here. These are tonnage requirements needed. So we're just looking at this, the surface area of the part we're molding, and we want to calculate that out. So as we calculate the area Again, we're looking at the required tonnage. If you remember, it's two to three tons per square inch. So I'm taking that area and I'm gonna calculate it by the higher number. I always go on my safety factor. So as you can see, just one cavity, we need 1.5 tons for, to clamp off properly on this one cavity. But you can see on the core diameter versus the cavity diameter, depending on the type of machine you have, you might not only, you might only be able to fit so many 
uh, so many parts within that molding parameter on your plat. So it's, it's always good to know, again, from the toolmaker to calculate out and know how big you actually need that platen to be for your clamp force. Here's another part of the spectrum, how small the part is. So with this, we're, we're looking at roughly 340 thousandths on a cavity OD. So calculating out that required tonnage for one part, we're less than half a ton. But if we were to build a 64 cavity mold, we would only need roughly 16 tons. Now it'd be hard to get a 16 ton machine, but options are there for your lower tonnage machines that you need as long as you have the required shot size in the injection unit. So again, it's, it's, it's very important to talk to the required personnel, your injection molding machine manufacturer, your mold maker, as well as your metering and mixing system vendor to ensure that you're getting the proper setup. Um, and then it comes in the tune, what material you're gonna need. So with, with talking to all the industry professionals out there, that will allow you to set up your system properly. And with that, I thank everyone for their time and I'll take any questions you have. Great. Thanks so much, Craig. I feel like that was kind of LSR soup, soup to nuts, which I, I was really helpful, at least for me. Um, and I, I see that most people stayed with us. So thanks again for, for your presentation. So we, we do have quite a few uh, questions coming in here. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them, but I'll we'll, we'll do our best here. So if if you do have any last minute questions here, make sure you put them in through the chat. And like I said, we'll we'll try and get to them. You know, if we do not get to them, Craig's information is on here. I'm sure he'd be happy to help after the fact. All right. With that, uh, first one here is: Does LSR exhibit fountain flow or plug flow? Fountain flow effect. So. Again, it's going to skin cure on the walls first, and it'll fountain flow itself to the last point of fill. Now, we can't affect that with velocity of injection, but you can see as you go from zero to filled part, you can see the fountain flow effect in that. Okay. Um... You may have touched on this, but why is the why water cool the screw instead of insulating it? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I have never seen an insulated barrel. Um, water cooling is, is always just been the easiest to, uh, to set up on a system. But it's not to say that insulating it wouldn't, um, uh, it, it, not to say it wouldn't work now, but, but remember we're creating friction in that barrel. Um, I can tell you from experience in the past with, uh, another injection molding machine vendor. A uh, customer on a brand new machine, we're metering the screw, um, and they actually damaged the non-return valve an hour into them setting up the machine for the first time. So, keeping it water cooled uh, that that does help from that uh, from the heat and the friction. Gotcha. Is the mixing and bonding of the two components an exothermic reaction? Um, again, good question. I believe so. Yes. I will have to look into that. If that individual wants to email me, I, I can look into that. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, how do you determine the proper static mixer size? That's a good question. So uh, to set it up, you want to look at what your total shot weight is. So that's part runner. If you have it or just part specific. Looking at if a standard mixer is going to work and usually it does. And, and the way that I always get it set up. Um, I always want to do an MDR. So moving di diameter of the mix material 1 to 1 ratio to see what our cure kickoff is. And when you're setting up for the 1st time, purge that material through. And do the same thing if you have the capabilities um, here at RDA, but we do have the capabilities to test that 
to ensure that you're getting that one-to-one -one ratio and your MDR is going to copy that, that hand-mixed material. Um, the thing that you always want to remember with LSR, we need velocity. We really want that material to bend and fold and mix together and be pushed to forced together. Um, in small shot capabilities, if we don't have a lot of movement on our metering system or on our screw and barrel, it, that's, that's telling you right there, you're not getting a good homogenous mix. You won't see it right away, but over a period of maybe 20 minutes to an hour, you'll start to get gummy, sticky parts. And that's telling you, you're not getting a good homogenous mix. Bring that screw and barrel back, purge material out, uh, refresh the system, and you'll be back to normal. That'll tell you right there that that system might be a little too large for your shot. Gotcha. Okay. Um, are these static mixers similar to mixers in an extrusion screw? Can be, depending on how you set it up. Now, these mixers are, are you know, they can either have plastic or you have steel. Um, we want to ensure that we're not, um, we're not breaking the plastic off um, because, again, the viscosity is lower. So uh, there could be a little bit of difference there. You have your salsa mixers. Um, uh, back in the day when I, I utilized those, you've got your standard static mixers now. So it, it could be similar. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're, again, uh, going to the vendor. Um, and there's some aftermarket types of mixers as well to, to look for out there. Great. Uh, what is a reasonable residence time to avoid any pre-gel issues? Very good question. Um, internally here, we're looking at doing that. And I talked about the viscosity. We can change that viscosity depending on the shear rate. And we can test, uh, again, different reciprocal seconds uh, for that shear rate. And we like to look at what that rebound effect will do. Now, in a uh, operator-driven setup, um, you can kind of see that, let's say, and this is, this is a, 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 not the best example, but let's say an operator has to shut their machine down, they go to lunch and they come back. That first shot they set up, uh, that, that they run, it, it might have some non-fills because you've got a rebound effect. As we, sh as we structure the material, we shear it down and the material actually structures itself back up. So it, it depends on the material. It depends on the, on the durometer. Um, that's why we set up for an automated process is we want to get that in and out as quick as possible. Now, if you don't have water cooling on the system, it will start to structure back a lot faster due to the heat being created, but keeping water on it will keep that structuring down. To say what's when it will start, Again, as I said, it depends on the material itself. You have different types of materials out there. You've got your opticals, general purpose. General purpose, you've got fast cure, very fast cure, or your standard. So the material can structure itself up, uh, structure itself a lot faster with different types of materials out there. Well said, okay. Um, next one, I'll, I'll handle it. So the presentation slides, we'll be posting uh, on our website this recording um, after we make sure that uh, everything looks okay with it. And, um, and I think uh, our D Abbott folks will, will be able to share on their side as well if you want to reach out to them. So I guess more of a logistics question there. Um, next one here, can you recommend tool makers for micro molding for LSR? Um, Certainly, we, we, we'd be happy to help you with that, too, but I, I'm sure, Craig, maybe offline you could uh, connect those folks. So wh whoever asked that question, I would, I would say reach out to Craig uh, or myself or both of us, and we certainly have um, lots of micro, micro tooling partners I know that we could set you up with. Um, okay, is there a way to mitigate flash and micro parts with the material formulation, for example, a higher viscos viscosity resin as opposed to a lower viscosity one, um, or does it only come down to mold design? I mean, it's a little, it's a, it's a little both. Your mold design, but then you also have to think of it, it the different types of materials you're running. Uh, depending on the viscosity, 
you know, a higher viscosity material, you're going to need more pressure on the injection unit to push it in. So it might be, you know, as well as the, as well as the injection systems are set up nowadays and as, as uh, detailed as the machines are to, to, to measure, um, you're now running a lower viscosity material. Um, you're going to have to change your process around. So it, it could be a little of both. It could be the type of material you're running. Um, you might not have the right material uh, versus the mold maker. And also it could be a little bit of the, uh, the injection machine, uh, injection molding machine that you're utilizing. Sure. Well, we, we've got quite the list of questions here. So if I don't get to yours again, we've got Craig's information on here. I don't, I don't think we'll be able to get to everything, but I do appreciate the, uh, the engagement here. So. Uh, next one, is there a rule of thumb for expected cure time for wall thickness? I always go by the rule of thumb that uh, I was taught years ago and at a set temperature, uh, uh, actual temperature, sorry, of 350 degrees Fahrenheit, it's four to six seconds per millimeter of cross-sectional thickness. Good to know. I'll say that again, four to six seconds per cross-sectional thickness, per millimeter cross-sectional thickness at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. That's a good rule of thumb. Now, what do you recommend for cleaning equipment for the main stack, but specifically for colorant stacks? Um, I like to uh, utilize, uh, we actually have a tank here uh, that I utilize. It's, uh, I'll throw a plug out to Heritage Crystal Clean and their Solvent 142. Uh, and also uh, Safety Clean with their, uh, oh, what is it? Solvent uh, 300, I believe. I would have to look into that, but I've used these, these solvents over my career. Um, it's, it's a mineral spirits base, but it's a lot, a little stronger. Um, works very well to cut the silicone down. And then I always make sure that I'm cleaning it with uh, an isopropyl alcohol, or we have ethyl alcohol here just to get the residue off and to make sure it's cleaned up. But um, for example, if I'm running, uh, I'm actually tearing a metering system down right now. Uh, I can set the, get as much of the silicone off the equipment as possible. I'll set it down to the tank and I come in the next day and everything is basically cleaned right off. I just give it a quick wipe with ethyl alcohol and reassemble it back together. Okay. Um, what can affect modulus in LSR mixing? Oh boy. Tough one. <laughs> Your durometer, durometer, short A hardness has an effect on modulus. Um, we can all, we can also get a, a tad bit of different modulus from a post cure as well. Um, boy, that's a good question. I would have to, I would have to ask our VP of technology, Mr. Rick Zebel, uh, that question. Um, I'm I'm not certain that we can change too much on modulus with LSR since the material is already set uh, versus more of an HCR where we'll get the base and then we can add different fillers and ingredients to it. So let me, um, wh whoever asked that question, you've got my email there. Please email me. I'd 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 love to look into that for you. I would love to look into that for myself. That's a that's a very good question. Um, do you guys teach courses on, on LSR? If so, maybe how, how to, how to get in touch there. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, actually we are, we are looking to set up, uh, a course this summer, um, as well as we really want to push. So for example, you know, talking with Sodic, uh, on, you know, maybe more webinars, um, or in person as we're, you know, being allowed to, to be brought back together. Um, I feel, I really feel, uh, and I think a lot of the industry does is, is we need to really educate. We, we really need to, um, you know, there's such a wide gap and we'd like to really shorten that and try to help out and try to educate as much as possible. 
Yeah, C couldn't agree more. I just want to say I, I do think we nothing solidified yet, but we do plan on on hosting Craig and, and, and R.D. Abbott at our facility in Chicago here. Um, you know what the topic is, what that looks like. Not not sure yet, but we've got uh, a kind of a, a, you know, a stadium theater for for training that, um, you know, we've got a, obviously everyone's email on here. So we'll we'll send you some information on that. But certainly reach out to Craig for their training as well. Okay. That one you touched on. Uh, how does injection pressure affect final part dimension? So injection pressure has a big effect on final part dimension. We talk about that shrink rate um, and compressibility of the material. So we can actually change um, how big that part is going to be with your injection pressure. Once you fill the part, we then want to go into hold pressure. So the little difference here between hold and thermoplastics is you're more of a gate freeze off versus hold in liquid silicone rubber. Again, remember I talked about the thermal expansion of LSR. All we're doing is we're trying to hold that material into the mold so we don't leak back and lose shot. So the more pressure we put on it, the bigger that part is going to be and our shrink rate can change. So you want to find that happy medium with, again, fill study, more of a design of experiment I like to do to try to find the best, the best process to fill that part and then add our holding into there. And then depending on your validation, how you have that set up, the measurements that you get to ensure that that part once it's molded and it and you can measure shrink that you're not out of your standards of how that part has to be manufactured. Great. Okay, where are we here? Is impingement needed in front of the gates? Impingement. I'm not familiar with that term actually. I'm not positive what they mean by the impingement in front of the gates. Yeah, maybe we'll take that one offline. Whoever asked that, maybe reach yeah, out to us separately here. Um, is there a rule of thumb for gate sizing? Um, it depends on the part size. Um, it also depends on uh, if you're running a uh, if you're running a dispersion. Um, we just uh, we just work with a mold maker um, out on the West Coast. They were running a part uh, into trial and they were getting a splay. We call it a splay effect at a gate where they were actually separating the color. Um, changing the gate size helped with that because it was shearing so hard and heavy at the gate. Uh, so the opening the gate up a bit helped with that a lot. So. It, it can affect that. And this is where your tool maker, a knowledgeable tool maker can, you know, they, they know these things where they've run in the past. They've got the experience where they know with this part size, they can run at this gate, but once they get to this volume, they have to change that gate size. And again, this is, this is why I, I, I will push, you know, everyone that I had in these presentations, these are the vendors to go talk to. Um, this will end, a, this will stop a lot of headaches on your startup and your setups by contacting these vendors. Great. Do you have to oversize your cavity to compensate for shrinkage of the part after cooling, like say you would for thermoplastics? Yeah, and and you you want to put in a shrink rate of you know anywhere li liquid silicone is anywhere from two to three percent, um, so you calculate in that shrink for it. The mold maker will calculate in the shrink. Um, if it's a different type of material, there might be a different shrink, but general rule of thumb is anywhere from two and a half to three percent shrink rate put in. Okay. This is a bit bit of a lengthy one. See if I can get it right here. Any recommendations on heating profiles to help cure LSR mixed with compound that has an I believe the word is it's spelled alkyne, but I believe alkaline 
I don't know, alkyne bond. Um, I have encountered uncured LSR when trying to mold dispersions containing alkyne compounds. Um, alkyne. May, may have to take that one offline. That's that that could so if it's mixed by hand, um, if you're ensuring you're getting a one to one ratio, but you also want to make sure that however that dispersion is set up. Remember, uh, liquid silicon rubber is a platinum uh, addition system. So anything that you put in there that can hinder that cure inhibition, um, peroxide, an acetoxy, uh, amines. Um, you will hinder that cure where you're not getting a, uh, uh, you're not going to be able to cure that silicone. So that's, that's definitely something to look into depending on what you're putting in there. You might not get a proper uh, vulcanization cure effect of the LSR. Okay, maybe we'll do a few, few more here. Um, again, we will not get to all these, but, um, we'll see what we can cover. Uh, vacuum pull. When is it? Best to pull it uh, during lockup or at lockup? So the best is to pull it right at lockup. I like to call it the kiss off position. So when you start to pull that material, the, the mold halves together. In, and again, move it, move it up close in setup, right when the vacuum seals are touching, that's when we want to pull. And we want to make sure that we're pulling as almost absolute vacuum in the cavities. Again, as I said, not the whole mold, but the cavities then lock up your mold um when you're when you've got the vacuum on the whole time and you pull it, it could be the difference between a uh, a trapped air burn blister versus a good part okay uh you mentioned clean filtered water uh, in this presentation a fair amount who would you recommend working with to ensure proper water quality um I always start out, um, if you're using city water, you want to get someone in there to treat your city water. Now, you've got different grain, different levels of a different city you live in. Um, me personally, I utilize a, uh, a dilution of uh, uh, polypropylene glycol and distilled water. Distilled water does not have the minerals in it that you, you get from tap water. So my system... And, and depending on what we bring in. So again, with an education here, or if we have an issue where we bring in a customer's tool for a trial, um, we don't know how that tool was set up or what it was running. So I can change the dilution level of my system by putting in more glycol or taking or adding more distilled water. And that way I don't ever have to check it. Um, I check the filter. I have a see-through filter uh, that I installed in line on my chiller. And I can see when that filter, if I got sediment built up, um, and then I can change it out. But if you're using long, long answer, but if you're using uh, city water, you definitely want to treat it because over time it's going to build up. Um, but I do recommend utilizing a, uh, a polypropylene glycol and uh, with distilled water. Okay. And I've tried, I've tried many over my career. This is actually a mix. Um, I have to thank a tool maker for that. Uh, they have a very intricate system where I, I kind of copied what they were doing and it works great for them. And, and I wanted to try the same thing here. Okay. Well, maybe a couple more here. Uh, and then we'll let folks get on their way. Do you see many molds that use insulator plates uh, as an Additional top clamp plate, which is then cooled to prevent platen heat up. Hopefully, got that right. Does that make sense? Um, if they're if they're talking about an insulator plate behind the mold on the moving side, um, if that's what you meant, I I have seen that to stop from heat transferring to the platen. Um, Make sure if you do that, you have standoffs in that insulator plate. Remember that insulator plate can crush. So we want to put standoffs throughout that insulator plate. So when we clamp that up, we're not changing, you know, your parallelism in your mold. That could have a big effect of when you go to clamp up, we could be 
on parallel and then create flash or we could clamp up a little tighter in one spot versus another. If that's what you meant with a plate, the insulator plate. Okay. Um, I'm going to pick one more here. So again, apologize if I don't get to your question. Okay, so with with hot runners, what is your preferred method in keeping the runner from sticking to the A side? Would this be a coating, uh, mold release, geometry, or some combination? First thing I want to look at is geometry. So if you set up a um, a reverse taper on your moving side, so if your runner's coming out, if you set up that little reverse uh, button or nipple on the on the moving side to allow that part to stick on there. So you're creating an undercut, uh, so to speak. That way, when the mold opens up, it's stuck in there. Uh, if you have no undercut, you don't have anything to allow it to stick to that moving side, it's always going to stick on that uh, on your stationary side. Um, the other thing to try, um, and don't go too far off in this, but you know, silicone likes to stick to the hottest surface. So if you can try to change your temp mold temperatures and again, I don't like to go too far up because now you're changing how the mold's clamping up and I don't like to do any damage, but maybe take it up, up upwards of five degrees warmer um, to see if you can help that stick. Uh, if that doesn't work, um, you can definitely, you know, add a little bit of a uh, reverse taper if you're able to for that runner to stick on the moving side for you. Well, well very good. I there's probably 30 or 40 more questions, so I just don't think there's any way we get to all of them. Um, you you see Craig's information here. Uh, I'm sure he's happy to help you guys online. Um, but I, I see that we're losing quite a few folks as we're, you know, we get, get over our hour. So I don't want to uh, take any more time here. So with that, thank, thanks so much, Craig. I, I personally learned a lot here, and I, I'm sure everyone else uh, online did. I can tell you. That's probably the, the most uh, engagement we've seen on the question and answer um, in our 32 webinars here. So um, good to see that. Um, uh, hopefully, you know, RD Abbott can uh, can join us again in here in the future. We we are going to continue running these Sodic and Friends webinars. Um, again, you've got Craig's contact information there. Um, you should have mine uh, from the invite as well. Um, if you ever need anything, but, uh, Craig, thanks so much. Bennett, thank you. And I want to thank Sodic again for having us. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for uh, taking time out of your day. I hope I answered most of your questions. If, if I didn't, again, my information's up there, please email Bennett or myself and uh, we'll try to help you out as best as we can. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Great. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bennett, thank you, sir. Thank you, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, take care. All right.